I invite you to open a Bible to 1 Corinthians chapter 15 as we go into God's word this morning to be reminded and comforted by the gospel. And as we open our Bibles to hear from the Lord, we open our hearts and minds in prayer. Our first prayer is for our hearts and minds that the Holy Spirit would speak to us, comfort us, and encourage us with the words of the Lord. Our second prayer is for our brothers and sisters in Christ that the Holy Spirit would comfort and encourage them with the gospel and that they would have open hearts and minds to receive the word of the Lord this morning. And finally, I ask that you would pray for me that I would preach faithfully and truthfully the word of the Lord and to boldly proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ for sinners. Psalm 19 says, may the words of my mouth and meditation of my heart be acceptable and pleasing to you, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Amen. So 1 Corinthians chapter 15 is this beautiful proclamation of the gospel. And so on this final Sunday of the church calendar, I thought it would be good for us to have a simple reminder of what the gospel is and what it means for our daily lives and for our faith. And in fact, in verse 1 of 1 Corinthians chapter 15, the apostle Paul writes, now I would remind you, brothers and sisters, of the gospel I preached to you, which you received and in which you stand. And so he's going to spend the next 58 verses specifically reminding them, here is what the gospel is. Now, it's not because... They didn't know, right, if he gave them a test or if I gave you an exam what the gospel is, I'm confident in our church members to be able to come up with an answer and say, this is what the gospel is. But what Paul is getting at is something that Luther often talked about, which is that we often forget the gospel in our hearts. We forget the reality of the gospel, that Jesus died to forgive your sins Yes, even the ones you struggle to confess. Yes, even the ones you're embarrassed by, ashamed of, the ones that you've been carrying around for years and decades or whatever it might be. He forgives your sins through his cross and that he has given to you and me the hope of eternal life and resurrection through his own death and his own resurrection. And we forget that in our daily living. We forget that we are saved by grace. We are saved by the works of Jesus. And we so often think, I've got to add to it. I've got to do a little bit more. And so as we come to the end of the church year and we see all that God has done throughout the year, we give thanks to him and we look forward to what he's going to do in the future. And we also look forward to what our end of year is going to look like and what our next year is going to look like. And we make plans and all these other things. It's important to be reminded of what the gospel is, to have that reminder of what God's grace is. So in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, starting at verse 3, Paul is going to summarize. I'm not going to go through all 58. I know some of you are panicking right now. Okay, just hang with me. Verse 3, though, if you have a Bible, open up to 1 Corinthians 15, verse 3. Paul says, here's what the gospel is. I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. So here's what the gospel is according to God's word, according to St. Paul, that Jesus died on the cross to forgive sins and that he rose again three days later to give us eternal life and to conquer sin, death, and the devil. And you go, well, I already know that. Well, that's good. Paul, though, knew that the church in Corinth already knew that message. He's saying, I've already preached this to you. By the way, I've already preached the gospel to you before more than once, and you should fire me if I ever stop doing that, because that's the whole point of us getting together, is to hear the gospel, to know the scriptures, and to go out into the world and share that gospel. So Paul is saying, I I want to remind you, brothers and sisters, here's what's of first importance. And I think the last Sunday of the church year is a good Sunday to put into perspective what is of first importance. Sometimes it's called Judgment Sunday. Sometimes it's called Christ the King Sunday. And all the scripture readings focus on the reality that Jesus will come back to judge the living and the dead, as we say in the creeds. So what is of first importance, according to God's word, is the gospel, is eternal destinies for all humanity, 
And we need to be reminded of what that means for us and what that looks like of how do we get that gift of eternal life. And Paul is saying, here's how you get the gift of eternal life. It is through the gospel of Jesus Christ, through his death and through his resurrection. And I love that he says, um, according to the scriptures. So this is nothing new. This is not something that the church made up. This is the gospel from the very beginning. In fact, going all the way back to Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, the world falls apart in one chapter. God makes everything. He says every time it is good, it is good. And then he gets to humanity and says it is very good. And then he creates Adam and Eve, puts them in the garden, and says, I want you to be stewards over my creation that I have given to you. And then as the story goes, Adam and Eve are tempted. They give into that temptation, and sin enters into the world, and it corrupts everything. It corrupts our relationship with God. It corrupts our relationship with the world. It corrupts our relationship with one another. And immediately, Adam and Eve begin blaming everything and everything and everyone else in all of creation about why they sinned. And God comes to them And he looks at them, and he has a conversation with them, and he asks them, what did you do? What happened? And eventually, Adam blames Eve and God, because they're the only two other beings in existence. So he doesn't want to take responsibility, so he says, it's God's fault for creating Eve. It's everybody else's fault. This is like, (laughs) it's the best, worst confession ever, okay? (laughs) Confess your sins. Well, it was your fault, and it was her fault. There's no one else left to blame, right? That's not a good confession. It's an example of a horrible one. Then God goes to Eve, and she asks her, what did you do? And she goes, oh, Adam forgot about the devil. So she blames the devil. And in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, God looks at the devil, looks at Satan, says this, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and hers, and he will crush your head, and you will strike his heel. So theologians in the church for generations have called this the first gospel. It is the first promise of sin has entered the world. Everything is corrupt. Everything is broken. All the relation, our relationship with God, the world, and each other is all messed up and broken. So the question becomes, how do we fix it? Of course, Adam and Eve tried to fix it by putting fig leaves on themselves to cover up their shame. They try to fix it by blaming others. They try to fix it by hiding in the garden away from God, which none of those solutions work. Hiding and ignoring sin doesn't make it go away. Covering it up doesn't cure it and make it go away. Blaming others doesn't cure it and make it go away. So the question becomes, how is anyone going to make things right? Everything has fallen apart. Everything is broken. How does things get made right? And in verse 15 of Genesis chapter 3, God makes this first gospel promise. He says, my descendant, my offspring through Eve, which Paul tells us in Galatians is Jesus Christ, will crush the head of Satan and his offspring, will give us victory over sin, death, and the devil. And so the answer becomes what you already know as good Christian Lutherans. The answer becomes, well, the cross of Jesus, which is why Paul says, I want to remind you, brothers and sisters, of the gospel, of the fact that Christ died on the cross, of the fact that Christ rose from the dead. And so in Christ, God is reconciling and putting all things back together. In Colossians chapter 1, Paul writes it this way, through him, so through Jesus, to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. So the whole goal of how is everything going to get put back together is the simple answer of the cross of Jesus. And I can't tell you how many times And throughout my ministry at various churches and various places where I've preached, where I've had people come up to me as Christians and complain about that sermon. Because they want to know more. Give me some more practical things. Give me more pragmatic things. I've had people literally ask me, when are you going to get to the real stuff? 
I said, I might not be your preacher. <laughs> because according to the scriptures, the real stuff of our faith is the cross and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. In fact, in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 17, Paul says, if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile, it is empty, it is worthless, and you are still in your sins. So the real stuff of our faith is the cross of Jesus. It's the message of God taking everything that was broken and making it right and putting it back together again. I brought a little show and tell from home this morning. This is one of my favorite crosses of all time. If you want a closer look at it after service, just come on up. Right? But this is a cross that my grandmother, that we called Nanny, made. And she would hand make these crosses. But the way they started out is, as you can see, there's all kinds of wires here, all wound and bound together. And there's all kinds of pieces of jewelry here. So what would happen is if you went into the room where she was making these crosses, it looked like an explosion and a complete disaster zone. Because in order to make it, everything had to be torn apart. So she would take jewelry and necklaces and bracelets and tear them apart to get the wires out and to get the beads out. And it looked like utter chaos. But at the end of it, when you put it all together, you get a beautiful cross. And this is what the cross is. This is what it is. It's God taking all the chaos, all the disaster, all the brokenness of sin, and as Paul says in Colossians, he's putting it all back together in himself through his blood on the cross. He's reconciling it all back together. And Paul says this is the real stuff of our faith. This is the whole point of calling ourselves Christians. It's the whole point of why on the last turn of the church here, we go, this is Christ the King Sunday. The reason he is our king is because he died on the cross and rose from the dead to give us victory over sin, death, and the devil. And as Paul says in verse 17 of 1 Corinthians chapter 15, if Christ has not been raised, then your faith is futile and you are still in your sins. Yet, in our epistle reading, starting at verse 20, Paul says, but in fact, and I just love how Matter of fact and bold Paul is. He just says, but in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead. Right? So he's saying, look, if it didn't happen, if the cross and the resurrection didn't happen, there's no point in you and I gathering to worship. Do you realize that? There's no point in you going, I'm a Christian. But the good news that Jesus is our king, the good news that Jesus is our savior, the good news that Jesus is Lord, is the fact in verse 20 that in fact Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. The word for first fruits here is eparche. It's a Greek word that means from the harvest or the firstborn child or the firstborn animal. And the picture that is meant to bring is that it's just the first one, there's more to come. And that's the beautiful picture. When Paul says Christ is the first fruits of the resurrection, he's saying there's more to come. There's more hope coming. Because it's not just Jesus that was raised from the dead. It will be all who believe in him who will be raised from the dead. And so Jesus is the first fruits, meaning there's more hope coming. Not just for Jesus, but for you and me, and for every single person who has ever believed in him, will be raised from the dead. Dr. Lockwood, in his commentary in 1 Corinthians, says it this way, Christ's resurrection was the pledge that all who had fallen asleep in him would be physically raised just as he was. And so Christ is the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. Now, Paul is not being, um, he's not just dismissing death and saying it's not real or it's not painful. But the word for falling asleep here is comaterion. And it's where we get our word cemetery from. And so cemetery literally meant the sleeping place. Because from the Christian perspective, the hope of Jesus is that he will wake us up on the last day when he returns as our conquering king. And he will raise us up into new life just as he was raised from the dead. So again, Paul's saying, he's just the first fruits. There's more hope coming. 
And when Christ the King returns to judge the living and the dead, he will raise up those who have fallen asleep in him to new life, just as he was raised to new life. And brothers and sisters of Christ, this is what Paul wants you to be reminded of every single day, of why you and I as Christians have hope. Because Jesus has risen from the dead, and because he has risen from the dead, a cemetery is just a sleeping place. Because there's more hope coming. There's more resurrection coming. And so we celebrate Jesus as our king, and we look forward to him returning. In verses 24 and 25, Paul writes, then comes the end when he delivers the kingdom to God the Father after destroying every rule and every authority and every power. And in Paul's language in his letters, every rule, power, and authority meant everything that went against God everything that was sinful, everything that was of the devil, everything that was opposed to the rule and reign of Jesus. So what he's saying is Jesus has conquered everything wrong with the world. He has conquered everything that is broken in the world. He has conquered the devil and all of his servants. And so we go, oh, that's why he's such a good king. That's why we should worship him and praise him and look forward to his coming because when he does this, he will have conquered sin, death, and the devil. And then he goes on in verse 25, for he must reign until he puts all his enemies under his feet, which is just a beautiful picture. I recently got a recliner, and I can't tell you how happy it makes me to have a recliner, to write my sermons there, to fall asleep, and then return to writing my sermon after I wake back up. But it's so relaxing to, at the end of the day, after you've done all your work, to do what? Put your feet up and rest and say, I'm done. All the work is over. And that's what Christ the King does to the devil and demons and everything wicked in the world. He sits down. He says, it is finished. And he puts his feet up on them and uses them as a recliner and says, the work is done. And so when we are looking forward to Christ the King coming back to judge the living and the dead, what we are looking forward to is him putting an end to sin, death, and the devil once and for all, right? Remember Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, he will crush your head, right? That's foot language. He's going to stomp and crush the devil, He's going to make him into a footstool and say, the work is done. I have accomplished everything you and I were looking forward to, everything you and I needed to be done, everything you and I were hoping for. And then lastly, he conquers death in verse 26. The last enemy to be destroyed is death. And this is the hope of Christianity. This is the gospel message that we carry into the world that Jesus conquers all things, including death itself. The thing that seems most fearful, the thing that seems most dreadful, the thing that seems most impossible to conquer, Jesus says, no, I have conquered it. It is the last enemy, but I have destroyed it. And this is why we go, it's Christ the King Sunday. We're looking forward to when he comes back to judge the living dead, because when he does, death is no more. Sin is no more. Evil and wickedness is no more. And here's the reality of the world. People need to hear that hope. They need more hope than just good advice. They need more hope than just the book of Proverbs. It's a good book, but people need more than that. They need more hope than just how to have a good marriage or advice on raising kids or promotions at work and how to do better with employees. The hope that people need most is the message that the last enemy to be defeated is death itself and that Christ our King has conquered death through his death and through his resurrection. And that what you and I are looking forward to as Christians is that one day Christ the King will return to judge the living and the dead. And when he does, death will be no more, wickedness will be no more, and sin will be no more. Let us pray.
Lord Jesus, we give thanks for your death and resurrection. We give thanks for the simple message of the gospel, that through your death on the cross, sins are forgiven, and through your resurrection, death in the devil is defeated. May we hold on to that good news each and every day. May we find hope and comfort in it, knowing that through you, Christ our King, you will raise the living and the dead to new life with you. Lord, as we go out into the world, may we take that gospel message with us, sharing that hope and the good news of your death and resurrection with all that we meet. In your name we pray, amen.